liberal societies and government. And there's a growing number of younger scholars who are writing in ways that call attention to the problems of this liberal, individualistic, free choice point of view. And they look at the collapse of societies and governments, the collapse of families, the collapse of churches, the collapse of guilds, and conclude that these results are not because of the failures of liberalism, but because of its successes. What they say is that this liberal life that's on order in this way of thinking has been achieved in full, and then the result is chaos. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. So many of those that I cite in the paper share an insight articulated by, by this gentleman, Michael Hanby. In this quote, he's referring to the US Supreme Court case that two years ago uh, was uh, uh, issued that now requires the entire United States to recognize the legality of same-sex marriages. In the United States, it is illegal to forbid men to marry men and women to marry women because of the result of Supreme Court cases. And the name of that Supreme Court case was Obergefell. <laughs> it was o Obergefell versus the United States. So you see what Hanby says. Obergefell, that case, marks a point of no return, a decisive moment when liberal order asserts its sovereignty over reality in a, very, in a new and dramatic way, and when the technological view of human nature and the human being, which was perhaps still only latent in our founding, now requires the full force of law. So in many of our societies in the West, there's a wholly new way of thinking <laughs> that is now reinforced by law that requires the challenge to the traditional patterns that we've known for centuries. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Hanby goes on, and I, I'm quoting him at length because it's really important to see what he's saying. He's describing what the liberal agenda, the liberal ideology, the liberal definition of being human leads to. He says that the liberal definition of, hu of being human <clears throat> and therefore the purpose of social life is what we can call radical freedom. So in this way of thinking, to be free, I must perpetually show, even if I have to carve it into my own flesh, and what he's referring to here is that some people even want, in this uh, name of choice, to change their gender, <laughs> to alter their sexuality through operations. But that's sort of the radical, that's the ultimate end of this way of thinking, that I am the owner of my body, that I and not the culture or tradition or another human being or God or even my given nature determine the meaning of what it is to be human. The architects of liberal order originally did not intend this. John Adams, he's referring to our, an early president and thinker, famously said, the American Constitution was made for a moral and religious people, but it is wholly unsuited to the government of any other. <clears throat> Yet now liberalism in, it, in its ultimate late form has led to the kind of frame that we have. He goes on to say that the cruel irony, and he's, here he's quoting a, a, a French thinker, Pierre Manet, points out is that liberal states tend now toward absolutism, not in spite of because of their under, underlying individualism. They become absolute in the very effort to defend freedom. The ironies abound. Because we demand this absolute freedom, we end up creating a very powerful state that will overcome and overturn any challenges to and obstacles to our freedom. The very, they become absolute in the very effort to defend freedom. A state which exists for the purpose of protecting negative freedom, meaning <clears throat> that everything is allowed, exists in effect to protect us from all those prior claims which threaten our self-definition, and so it must insinuate itself, so to speak, between me and those agents and institutions which lay claim to me. Nature, family, society, the church, God. In this way, the liberal state comes to act as the mediator of all human relationships. <clears throat> so you see what adopting this way of thinking leads to. It leads not to freedom, but it leads to absolutism. It leads to the creation of a state that governs and controls everything in order to advance our freedom. It's a remarkable irony. <clears throat> well, this definition has many expressions, popular and theoretical and academic. Many of these forms of supposed enlightenment target marriage and family and sexuality. 
Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, there's a, a brand new book, a recent book published in the West, uh, written by Claire Chambers, a scholar, an English scholar. And the title of the book is Against Marriage, Against Marriage, an Egalitarian Defense of the Marriage-Free State. You can just hear in that title uh, what the thrust of the book is, Against Marriage, an Egalitarian Defense of the Marriage-Free State. <clears throat> she says, what distinguishes marriage from any other relationship? Basically, she says nothing. Yeah, in the traditional understanding that I think we, we can uphold here, we know that marriage is a given. It's rooted in creation. It's rooted in redemption. It's rooted in our very human nature and our identity. But this open choice, individualistic understanding says that marriage is distinguished by nothing from any other relationship. It's not set apart by its durability because unmarried partnerships can be more permanent than married ones. <clears throat> Children are not the only soul not the sole preserve of marital relationships. In most liberal democratic societies, she says, it's just as common for children to be born to unmarried parents as to married ones. Actually, it's becoming the case that it's more common to be born now to unmarried than married in many Western societies. Unmarried partners cohabit and are financially dependent. They celebrate anniversaries and exchange tokens of love. Unmarried partners make commitments. So she says marriage is not singled out by commitment or permanence or children or love it is also not distinguished by religion. Some marriages are religious, but many aren't. She says the only distinction between marriage and unmarried partnership is the role of the state. It's the state that makes marriages, she says. Now you see what's going on. This is a whole shift in thinking about these relationships, that it's all voluntary, it's all by choice, and it's all by legality. The only thing that distinguishes marriage from anything is the role of the state. Marriage is a form of relationship recognized and regulated by the state. So she go, goes on that way. <clears throat> well, you can see how this way of thinking, this individualistic way of thinking that emphasizes rights, that emphasizes my rights over everything else, leads to these kinds of conclusions, leads to the adoption and the, and the legal requirement of the total restructuring and redefinition of the holy estate of matrimony, even in Western societies. <clears throat> well, uh, C.S. Lewis and many others, of course, began their analysis from a di very different point of view than does Chambers or any of the other liberals cited here. His is an understanding of reality in which there is no secular, no realm that stands apart from creation, grace, or God's judgment. By noting that membership in the body of Christ, which is also the bride of Christ, as Lewis says, he points out the principle that the matrimonial household is central to the understanding of existence, of well-being, of creation, as well as to salvation and the good of all. <clears throat> it's thus a, a permanent good prior to lesser goods. Salvation, true restoration to holiness, is the completion of what was intended from the beginning, that which was disrupted by sin and is being reordered by redemption. Next slide, please. <clears throat> there are many uh, ways in which you can see the understanding that what we describe as matrimony is <clears throat> essential to human existence, essential to human nature. Uh, one of the uh, Play, uh, sources that I cite for this, <clears throat> as I've already mentioned, is the theology of the body that was developed in the Catholic Church, uh, especially under the leadership of uh, Pope John Paul II. <clears throat> uh, he describes the human body and our existence as being defined primarily by marital meaning or nuptial meaning. <clears throat> Let me just read this uh, citation which is somebody commenting on the theology of the body. <clears throat> In discovering the nuptial being of the body, Adam and Eve realized that they were a gift for one another. They were presented to each other by God. Just as their gift to one another was one of love, so also was God's gift of the other to each of them one of love. They thus came to realize that in loving one another, in giving themselves to each other, they mirrored the gift of God to them. Their union of love was simultaneously a mirror, a reflection, an image of God's love for them. 
their union made visible the interior life of God. Not only were each of their bodies taken individually, the expression of who they were and a revelation of who God is, but in acting, loving each other, Adam and Eve made visible the love of God, i.e. the love of the Trinity. <clears throat> of course, not knowing of the existence of the Trinity, Adam and Eve could not consciously reflect the love of the triune God, but they were conscious of mirroring the love God showered on them when he created them for each other, and of course, the love God the love shown by God when he created the whole world for them. The Pope remarks that the love of Adam and Eve is a primordial sacrament, understood as a sign that transmits effectively in the visible world the invisible mystery hidden in God from time immemorial. And this is the mystery of truth and love, the mystery of divine life in which man really participates. That's a lovely statement. That's a, that's a rich and... and beautiful theological elaboration of creation, of the nature of creation, and the fact that we can't even understand creation and understand our existence apart from the image of marriage. Not only originally the marriage, which is at the beginning and the core of creation, but the awareness that the love of God for humanity, the love of God for us, and his sustaining love for us can be understood in marital terms. This is why St. Paul in his letter to Timothy denounces false teachers who depart from the faith by devoting themselves to the deceitful spirits and teaching of demons, among which are those who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. So I argue in here that any derogation of marriage as defined in creation strikes at the heart of creation itself and undermines faith and holiness and is subject to judgment. So that original verse that I read from Hebrews, marriage is honorable, precious, dear in everything, and those who defile it will be judged, I think extends not only to those who individually violate the sanctity of marriage, but any structure, any argument, any uh, one who tries to bring down the centrality of marriage, which we're seeing in many societies, many cultures. <clears throat> Please go to the next slide. And <clears throat> until I'm interrupted, I will <laughs> just show a couple more things that uh, I tried to cite uh, as ways in which this is elaborated in the scriptures and in elsewhere. And of course, the central affirmation of all of this of what we might call the marital structure of the human being that shows in the material expressions in the nature of human creation, maleness and femaleness are God's purposeful expressions of the image of God. In differentiating, huma hu differentiating humanity, God shows forth what is unified in the Father. The life-giving and life-bearing energies unified in God are granted to humanity in his image, in maleness and femaleness. God draws out the female from the safe substance as the male in his articulation of the human being. It is the unifying of these in matrimony that brings forth the purposes of God in creational activity. The household of God is reflected in the nurturing of the human household. So our Lord Jesus Christ, in response to a question about divorce, says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So said the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 19, in sacramentally ordaining marriage and its permanence. And he's clearly speaking of individual specific marriages, but he's also speaking of marriage. <laughs> let not man tear that apart. <laughs> let not human beings undermine the truth and the centrality and the absolute necessity of marriage. <clears throat> Next slide, please. A couple more expressions of this that you will be familiar with, I'm sure, include the imagery of the bride of Christ and the relationship between human marriage and our salvation as in being incorporated in the bride of Christ that St. Paul expresses in Ephesians 5. This is lovely instruction to marriages about how they're to operate. But you can see how St. Paul combines 
the uh, essential nature of salvation with how we live in marriages. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, says St. Paul, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. <clears throat> he has more to say about that, but clearly he demonstrates not only the centrality of marriage to creation and identity, but also to salvation. We can't understand salvation apart from marriage, <laughs> apart from that the church is the bride of Christ and becomes the body of Christ and will fully become the body of Christ. This is what we're talking about. This is why we have to anchor all of our inquiry, even our scientific and empirical uh, explorations in this, in this truth. A couple more citations. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, this is Hogan again uh, commenting on the theology of the, of the body. Marriage then is, as the Pope writes, the primordial sacrament because its method and effect were renewed and taken up in the sacrament of redemption and in its continued presence through the church. Founded on the analogy with the sacrament of creation, in other words, the marriage of Adam and Eve, the church can be said to be the bride of Christ because as one flesh with Christ, the church reveals God and confers grace on humanity. Marriage, the sacrament of creation, was the foundation of how God works in the world. That's the foundation of how God works in the world. <clears throat> one more slide, please. Next slide. And this is from St. Augustine. He's commenting on the Gospel of John. And he's referring to that moment when at the crucifixion, the soldier thrust the spear into the side of Christ. <clears throat> it's a pregnant word, he said, th that the evangelist used. And Augustine says he does not say the soldier thrust it into his side or wounded him in his side, but that he opened his side. This blood was poured out for the remission of sins. This water was preparation for salvation's cup. It made the cleansing water and the good drink. Therefore, the first woman was made from the side of a sleeping man and called life, the mother of living. That's what Eve means. Adam means man. Eve means the mother of living. She signified a great and good thing before the great woe of sin befell the church. And the second Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ, fell asleep here on the cross with head bowed so that his spouse might be formed from what flowed from his side. Isn't that one of the most beautiful statements you've ever read? The parallelism between creation, the creation of man and woman, and the drawing out of the woman from man, and on the cross, the opening of the side, and the drawing and the formation of the bride of Christ from the sacrifice of Christ. <clears throat> if nothing else convinces us of this, it ought to be the heavenly celebration of the church's fulfillment revealed by St. John in Revelation. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linens, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this down, blessed are those who are, who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Well, there are many uh, things to uh, think about socially and politically from this, and I've already indicated that in political theology, uh, there are many uh, expressions of the ways in this reality, the reality of creation and redemption, then work out in our thinking about how we live socially. Uh, this citation is from the social teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It's catechism uh, number 214 of the compendium the priority of the family over society and over the state must be affirmed. Back to my original point. The family, in fact, at least in its procreative function, is the condition itself for the existence of everything. 
With regard to other functions that benefit each of its members, it proceeds in importance and value the functions that society and state are called to perform. The family rec possesses the inviolable rights and finds its legitimation in human nature and not in being recognized by the state, contrary to what I quoted you earlier. The family then does not exist for society or the state, but the society and, se and the state exist for the family. Every social model that intends to serve the good of man must not overlook the centrality and social responsibility to the family. In virtue of this principle, public authorities may not take away from the family tasks which it can accomplish well by itself or in free association with other families. On the other hand, the same authorities have the duty to sustain the family, ensuring that it has all the assistance that it needs to fulfill properly its responsibilities. <coughs> so this is from Catholic social teaching. So in my paper, I argue that matrimony and the household are the essential facts of creation, human life, and redemption. They're the foundations upon which all other expressions of society are built. Whatever the terms, it should be clear that no derogation of this honorable estate should be allowed by law, policy, or any social practice, and that all public efforts should be evaluated by the standard of serving the household, serving marriage. I ex think this should extend to anything that can be, si be considered public in modern terms, whether it's policy on land, national security, taxation, development, refugees, education, business, licensing. It's a, a, a horror when there are so many things that seem to work against the good of the family or which extract or exploit the family for the benefit of others. Displacement of households for partisan ends is an abomination. The support and encouragement of healthy and proper matrimony in households should guide all policymaking. And it, of course, should, should guide what we do in the church as well. There should be uh, no thinking that the state should govern the activities of the family, but in a sense should stand out of its way and enable through the things that the state <coughs> does well, what civil government does well, uh, the support of the formation of marital households. <coughs> One more slide, please, and then we'll stop. <coughs> Just to reinforce this, this is back to Lewis again. The secular community, since it exists for our natural good and not for our supernatural, has no higher end than to facilitate and safeguard the family and friendship and solitude. Collective activities are, of course, necessary, but this is the end to which they are necessary. Great sacrifices of private happiness by those who have it may be necessary in order that it may be more widely distributed. And he's writing in the context of the Second World War. All may have to be a little hungry in order that none may starve. But do not let us mistake necessary evils for good. The mistake is easily made. Sometimes fruit has to be tinned if it is to be transported and has to lose thereby some of its good qualities. But someone sometimes meets people who have learned actually to prefer the tinned fruit to the fresh, believe it or not. A sick society must think much about politics as a sick man must think much about his digestion. To ignore the subject may be fatal cowardice for the one of the, over the other. But if anyone comes to regard it as the natural food of the mind, if either forgets that we think of such things only in order to be able to think of something else, then what was undertaken for the sake of health has become itself a new and deadly disease. You get the image. If you come, become focused on your health, then that means you're sick. <laughs> and by analogy, he's saying if we become so absorbed and focused on politics or economics itself and forget what they're for, they're for the household, <laughs> they're for the support of marriage and the family, <clears throat> then society is sick. So we have much to pray for and much to consider and much to uh, be concerned about as we're constantly being uh, called upon to devote ourselves to collectivities, uh, to uh, activities that derogate the family. And even as we have the challenges of many different ideologies and ideas that seek to undermine it. But let me argue that for the sake of souls and for the sake of her own obedience, the church and all of us should reclaim and continually reaffirm the honorable calling to enable men and women to enter holy matrimony, to form holy and consecrated households, and for those households to be formed into the larger body of Christ, the people of God, the bride of Christ. These must be proclaimed as vital to human existence and necessary components of the faith 
which is accompanied by knowledge with all discernment. And they thereby become central to the public witness of God's church. This will be crucial not only to the church's strength and growth, but to her integrity and faithfulness to reveal truth. By doing so, the church will serve the good of all, the common good, but more importantly, it will affirm that the church itself is the great household of God, the bride of Christ, which is the kingdom of God, the life of the Holy Trinity, extended and open to those who will come into it and be united with the life of God. Thank you. I think we can do better than that. Wasn't that fantastic? Thank you, thank you, Reverend Dr. Lawrence, for a wonderful presentation. I want to believe that all of us have been challenged in one or another. Allow me to say that you, me, and your neighbor, we are a product of a union between male and female. True? Good. And so this is a very important topic for us to discuss. And at this point, I want to call upon all of us here to deepen our understanding of the topic. I want to believe that you've been jotting down questions because we want to engage the speaker. We want to ask how this can be possible, how we can see marital relationship be central in everything that is done in our nation, Uganda. I also want to believe that the marriage ministry or marriage institution is under attack. We believe that. It's under attack. Therefore, we who are seated here and with the different discussions we are having, I think we are supposed to come up with ways and solutions and how we can protect the marriage institution. Doctor, you made a statement when you were starting and talked about political theology. And all of us here, many of us have believed that politics is a dirty game. And when you talk about politics in the church circles, many of us don't want to hear that because we tend to think church, marriage is separate from politics. But I think today we have been educated. Not so. We have been enlightened. And so here, we're going to ask questions in relation to what he has discussed. But he has made powerful statements such as, that marriage, the male and female union is important to cre the creation story. It's important for God's redemptive plan and the good for all. He has also made a powerful statement here, and I think we can ponder on this statement, that marriage does not exist for society or the state, but the society and state exist for the family. Have you ever thought about something like that? You have really enlightened us. So please, we, if you have questions, I'm going to welcome the questions. He has also made a powerful statement here. There are very many fundamental statements that Doctor has made here. But he's also said that strong marriages lead to benefits such as physical, emotional health, financial stability, provision, personal development, education, social stability, and development. So if we want to see all the benefits mentioned, we have got to encourage and advocate for strong marriages. Anyone with a question to doctor? We want to thank you. I'll ask someone to help me. Please, let's write down some questions. If you have a question, write down. And I think by show of hand, before he asks his question, if there's another person, please let's first get five hands up and then we'll get them all at once and engage the doctor. One, two, three, four. Oh, it's only this section. Was it because this section is closed? Any other person this side? So we have five hands up before he comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the presenter for this good topic. Um, I have a series of questions to to ask. One is uh, your presentation comes across as like emphasizing the traditional 
set up of a family. He also went ahead and made an assertion about the need to ground, in my understanding, family management in reality. Yes. Now, which is the reality that we are dealing with? We each, which is the family? Are we talking about a family that increasingly is becoming extinct? Are we talking about the emerging family that we refer to as largely single, single-headed families, largely dysfunctional? If we say the church, Christianity, is for the family, which family are we trying to save? And how do we save it in this changing reality? Number two is the African family. One leg in mysticism, one leg in progressive uh, politics, if you like, of family management. How do we manage this? There is total confusion. Yes. When things get hard, I become very traditional. When they are okay, I do a lot of PR, appear as a progressive man. While everything around me is falling apart, how do we use theology, Christianity, to put a bit of sense to this chaos? I thank you. Thank you. He's requested that he attends to one at a time. So let's allow him respond. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. <clears throat> That's a very good question, and I expected that it would be asked because it sounded, uh, and the paper is intended to establish a theological norm, and not only a theological norm, but a natural norm, one that I believe fully can't be denied from the order of creation and uh, as well as from the order of redemption. Uh, so to uh, want to, in, because of any progressive reasons, do away with maleness and femaleness and with the essential relationship that's at the core of everything, if we start to untangle that and, and diminish that, then we're denying many other things that are true about our identity and our existence. But I, I fully understand the practical side. Uh, and uh, in the paper, I address some of these issues a little bit more at length than I was able to bring up here because it's obvious that under conditions of sin, as well as under the social and other pressures that we're all subject to, that there are very few ideal examples <laughs> of this. Uh, there are many who are not even called into marriage, that are called to a celibate life. There are many whose marriages, uh, for different reasons, no longer exist. So we, we know that each individual will not necessarily experience the uh, perfection, if you will, of, of a marital relationship. Uh, but the argument is that this is still the central norm, the central vision for human life and for uh, social life, and that it has to be. Uh, so how the, the, the response to the practical issues is that, yes, indeed, we need to find ways and need to develop ways in the church and socially uh, to, and politically even, uh, to, to support what is the natural and creational truth. Uh, we, we need to uh, ensure that, as I said at the end, that there's nothing that undermines family life. Uh, I, I am aware that African families tend to be structured very differently from Western families. Uh, in the West, in recent years, it's become very nuclear. Uh, and isolated, we don't have as <clears throat> many of the extended families. Uh, but I, I still hold to, because that first verse that I put up from Hebrews, um, I, 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 and I fully understand the issue of enculturation, but that is a universal statement. Marriage is honorable, precious, dear, everywhere, in everything. Uh, and let's, let's hold to that, and then from there we can talk about the practical ways in which we can be su supportive of, of, of families and help them develop. And also find ways to include those that find themselves 
uh, apart from families. One of the best things about the African family, it seems to me, that I've observed, and I haven't had that much experience of it, is that everyone gets included somehow. <laughs> There's almost no one who's left out because you have an ethic of hospitality and an ethic of inclusion. Uh, Westerners sometimes find this very hard because sometimes we want to be alone. <laughs> And Africans think we ought not to be alone. You know, we have to uh, live with somebody or eat with somebody. Uh, so that's a very wonderful aspect that we can, we can learn from in the West. There's probably a lot more that I could say about it, but uh, I, I really want to hold to the centrality of this, this biblical vision and, and not allow other ideologies uh, to uh, allow, allow us to, to give up on that simply because it's difficult. So thank you. Is there another question? Uh, thank you, Dr. Lawrence, for that presentation. My name is Catherine Mugabo. Maybe my first question would be, even in this space, I'm wondering, am I speaking as a parent because I'm a parent of four? Uh, or am I here uh, in, uh, representing an organization? But for my question, um, and therefore that's for me a question to reflect upon, even in spaces like this. It's a conference about the family. Um, I don't know, I, I would be curious to find out who is here to speak on behalf of the family, which is at the center in this place. Um, my question is, uh, Doctor, um, alluding to one of the principles you spoke about, I'm curious to learn from you, what are the practical processes or ideas you could share with us that could help the family um, one, to be equipped with a voice in the spaces because you said if we formulate policy, laws, and all these things that are happening, whether it's the development agenda yes. or whatever it is, if the family is going to be at the center, what processes can bring the voice of the family on the table? Because many times it's other voices. It's maybe people working with families, not yes. necessarily the family. And yes. I understand the representative maybe democracy or whatever process that is, but in, the, in a practical sense, where is the authentic voice of the family mm -hmm. in spaces such as this? Right. And therefore, what processes, if any, would you propose or ideas that can bring that to life? Thank you very much. Yes, well, it seems to me, and, and my argument is that because the church understands itself to be the bride of Christ and that the church is the household of God and that the church is composed of, in its local expression of households, that the church should never flag in its responsibility to prepare people for marriage, to prepare people to form households, uh, and to undertake that work. Uh, and uh, also by doing that, being the primary public advocate for the family. I really believe that that is uh, one of the essentials for the church's public witness. Uh, along with that, though, obviously there can be uh, many other ways in which it's expressed. Uh, this ought to be a part of our education. Uh, in, <clears throat> in the West, education, at least education in the government schools, is often anti-family. Uh, and that's why in the West, many uh, Christian families are now adopting models of homeschooling or of forming uh, Christian schools in order to educate properly. But we ought to work on education policy. We ought to work on uh, other ways in which the formation of healthy households, at, which, at the core of which is holy matrimony, uh, takes place. I don't know all the mechanisms in any particular society. I do think that civil society, other organizations, and I, I hope they're allowed to flourish uh, in this polity uh, in ways they are elsewhere, but we ought to form associations for specific ends. Uh, the one I'm aware of uh, in Uganda is called Family Life Network, uh, led by Stephen Langa, because I've met him, but I'm sure there are others as well. But um, let's make sure our orientation is clear, and I, I really don't think that the um, end is to make the family more and more dependent on the state. That's not the goal. It's not, uh, it's not more welfare. It's not more uh, direct governance of the family. But it's requiring the state, the state which rises and falls. It will, it will fade away. It's a temporary arrangement. It's a modern arrangement that we've 
uh, come up with in the world in, in recent centuries in order to provide an institution that will aid with infrastructure and, and govern the economy in a proper way. But let's make sure the economy, for example, is all about households. You know, so many economies are structured simply for the benefit of a few. Uh, and that which ought to be providing for and benefiting households is actually extracted by corporations or governments through corruption or whatever ways. All of those things really have to be done with the household in mind, I think. Uh, and what other motivation would there be? I'm, I'm sure in the course of this conference, perhaps we can talk about in smaller settings some very specific policy uh, directions that, that we might, might propose. But, but thank you for your question. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Any other question? Yes, please. Thank you for your uh, very timely presentation. Uh, I liked the approach that is conservative and others called it traditional. And uh, it raises some questions. My name is Paul Mukasa from Bugema University. And I'd like to address a question to you in view of your conservative approach. How can we reach out to those who think otherwise, such as those who think about same-sex marriage? How, how can we reach out? Since we see the family is having a redemptive approach, how can we be so kind and loving in our approach to bring them back into the fold? That's question number one. Uh, number two, when we look at our themes, we look at family as either in crisis or changing. In, our, in your approach, do you, do you look at the family in crisis or is it simply changing? Because those two are different. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Those are very broad questions. And I, I do appreciate the, the focus on the first one. The, um, there, there are many pastoral issues and many um, personal issues that are involved with that first matter that you raise, those that desire same-sex marriage or same-sex relationship. I think even saying those two phrases, I hope will make clear what the point of my paper was, that marriage by nature and by creation is impossible between anyone other than a male and a female, between a man and a woman. Uh, it is not a marriage, a relationship between two men is not a marriage. Now, I think a relationship between two men can be very close, can be very brotherly. That list of um, instructions that are found in Hebrews uh, that the one on marriage falls right in the middle of, it begins with, let brotherly love continue. And it's a very broad uh, expression to all of us that brotherly love, the brotherhood, uh, the, the love of the fellowship is what we, what is the context of everything. So, you know, men can be very close friends, uh, but they cannot enter into a marital relationship and everything that's involved with that. I think we have to say that. And we say that based on creation. We say that based on natural law. Uh, there'll be a presentation this afternoon about the natural family, which I think will address it from a slightly different point of view. But, but pastorally and sensitively, we have to approach those that, that deal with those struggles in very compassionate ways and uh, guide them to celibacy. I, I, and, and celibacy means it can, can involve very close friendships, but it just cannot be a marriage. Um, that, that has been the teaching of the church for centuries and is uh, expressed clearly in some places, especially in Catholic, Catholic social teaching. <clears throat> I, I, my, my response to the second point is, obviously the family is in crisis <laughs> everywhere. And uh, I think the family is always in crisis. Uh, we, we affirm these truths that I'm affirming, but everything godly is always under attack by the evil one and by the structures that want to, to change. So there, there's always a crisis. That's why we always have to revisit these issues and these concerns continually. Even when we think everything is okay, uh, you know, the devil is 
sometimes prowling around like a roaring lion and we know he's there. Sometimes he slithers up behind us in a tree <laughs> and whispers in our ear, uh, just to use, use that imagery. So we always have to be attentive to the crisis. Obviously families change and, and family structures are going to change according to many different kinds of conditions, economic and socially. Um, but but I, will, I will continue to hold that at the core of the family, and that's the basis of this argument, a family should be formed largely around a marital household. And I say that largely because I know there are going to be, going to be exceptions. And I think even those that are living in what are households at which a marriage is not the center of are by extension still a part of a marital household either the one they originated in or one that, that they are, are welcomed into. Uh, so there will always be changes. There will always be uh, changes in how families live. Sometimes families live together with other families. Sometimes they live in um, individual houses. Uh, sometimes there's inequalities in families. And all of those things have to be addressed. And that's the task of political theology, to, to bring truth to bear on all of these situations on a, on a regular basis. So I hope... I hope the church never gives up on, on uh, addressing these, these social concerns. Thank you. I think before we take the next question, of course, from his presentation and also going back to the Bible, we know very well that marriage was intended between male and female. But the reality is there are relationships, marriage relationships between male and male, female and female. So I want to pose the same question to us here. How can we reach out to the, such people involved in same-sex relationships? A question is posed to at least two people to respond before we get another question. How can we reach out to couples or to people involved in same-sex relationships, same-sex marriages? No what? They are not marriages. <laughs> relationships. Yes, the reality is that they're happening. So as a church, as people who have come to study more about marriage and families, how can we reach out to such rela people in relationships like that? I, we, I think... I by show of hand, please, because we want to... Yes, please. I, I thank the presenter for his approach. He said we must be compassionate. And there is no way that you can woo back people of that nature without using a lot of compassionate approach. Thank uh, you. We also need to, be, to, to view them as human beings who need to have salvation. But also we have to avoid a judgmental approach because there is always a way of pushing them to, to the other end and never be able to, to bring them back into the stream. But if, if we approach a compassionate approach, we probably uh, bring them back into the fold. But also we have to understand that these are human beings drawn away by right. one force or another force. Yeah. And they are also the object of salvation and they are also our mission. If we take them that way, we will use all strategies to help them to come back to the fold. And, and let me respond to that because that's, that's exactly right. And I, what I hope we can point out, if, especially if we dwell deeply on this whole area called the theology of the body, that even those that have same-sex attractions are still maritally structured. In their basic human nature and in the structure of their bodies, they are still uh, what, Saint, what John Paul called the marital structure of the body. You see what I'm saying? They are still male and female. And the very nature of and, male and female is that reciprocal complementarity of it. So what has happened is the disruption of that. Uh, so yes, they are absolutely uh, persons created in the image of God and they're created that way. So a place to start is to help recover the truth of who they, who they really are. It's very difficult. I mean, we can't deny the absolute um, power of those kinds of orientations and, and they are not just a matter sometimes of, of choice they're, they're formed and forced by many other things so I, I agree with you we can't just reject we can't just condemn or chastise uh, but we have to be very clear on what we believe and then pastorally find ways to, to counsel and to, 
and to assist in holiness and purity. Let me add that in our attempt to bring them back to the fold, we should avoid to compromise our biblical principles. Thank you, thank you. I think that's the point. The point is made very clear here. Or oh, someone wanted to add on to that. I think our time is fast spent, so can we go to the next? Very fast. I did not introduce myself. Jasper Mayek of the African Enterprise Institute. Now, I came here purposely to listen to broad views. I expect the outcome of this conference to be grounded in what will come out of our conversations, not predetermined. And if we attempt to predetermine the outcome of this conference, whichever policy you will develop to save the struggling family will capture nothing. The reality is we are living with the families on families in a complete crisis. True, there are various responses to the confusion in the family. For example, what leads a man to choose to love a man or a lady to love another lady? It's the response to certain realities, extreme response, until we understand what that is rooted in. You can preach, you can do everything, you will not convert. So my concern is before you preach to them to come back, what is informing this rebellion? How do you address it? And that's what I expect from here. So I want us to be a bit flexible on how to go about it. I know we'll capture the issue of, 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 of Christianity and theology right. as a way of dressing whichever comes out of our conversations here to inform policy. I thank you. Thank you, thank you. There is a need to do more research, not so? I need to do more research so that we can address all issues. Thank you. Let's go to the another question. Um, hello. Hmm? Dr. Larry, thanks so much. I really appreciated the presentation. Um, I'm Tusimi Jordan McGurn. I work for Uganda Partners here at UCU. So I have two questions. Um, first, I'm curious if you would share something about, um, we talked about liberalism. What about capitalism, which is kind of liberalism's economic twin? Can you mention somehow capitalism, which many people in the world currently want and they want to continue in their context? How does that um, cause issues for the family? Second, I'd like you, this keeps coming up, but celibacy. Can you mention more about how celibacy, people who are called to celibacy, people who face celibacy because of the circumstances and or both, as an honorable Christian call, there's been celibate monks for, you know, 2,000 years now. Yes. How has that been part, how can that be part of the family, the narrative of the family you're sharing? And just as a point, um, obviously everyone operates with a theology. So you're, you have Christian theology, you have a different theology. So the question is, if emerging from Christian theology, what policies could emerge from that context of Christian reflection rather than a different ideology? Right. So okay. I'd love to hear... Yeah, I'm curious more about the Christian perspective, of course, because, yeah, that's obviously a, an important part of the world, and in true, I guess, if we think the triune God is actually the real God of the universe. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. <clears throat> well, just on that last one, uh, refer back to what I read from Oliver O'Donovan, uh, in which he says that the Christian ethics, because it addresses the order of reality rooted in creation and builds its norms that are addressed to everyone. Uh, I don't think we have to, yes, we distinguish and indicate that it's our Christian theology of, of the Trinity, of salvation, our Christology uh, that informs all of this, but we don't have to say this is only for Christians and that something else is for Muslims and something else is for secularists because it's for all people. Uh, First Timothy chapter two, <coughs> uh, Paul instructs the church to pray for kings and all those in high places that we might and, it, and for all people that all people might live lives of godliness of dignity of peace and justice that's a framework that he gives and it's addressed to everyone so th there's a lot more to say about that and but that's the that's the core of christian political theology that it's not just for christians that it's 
social ethics, if you will, for, for everything. So we can speak without embarrassment of the principles that we have and the ap applicability of them. Uh, on the economic, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, I focused on uh, a rights um, emphasis in liberalism and the aspects of individual freedom uh, expressed in these different ways, but that's clearly tied, and in, in the work of the uh, scholars that I've mentioned who are starting to um, deconstruct, if you will, or, or analyze, critique Western liberalism, they're seeing also that there's a very strong correlation between this emphasis on individual rights in these personal realms and social realms with the economic realms. Uh, and the, the thing that ties them all together is excessive individualism. If you assume that an economy exists primarily for the good of the individual and that the economy is driven primarily by individual activities, this is what many people interpret the teachings of Adam Smith and the basics of hidden hand liberal economics to be. <coughs> that, each, that, what's, that way of thinking says that if everyone pursues his or her, her own individual self-interest, then over time and through the collective activities of everyone, the good will be achieved. But that's really hard to sustain in practice because we see in that kind of individualistic liberal economics, the tendency toward um, the undermining of households and also the uh, ill distribution of, of goods. Uh, so uh, in Catholic social teaching, for example, there's a principle called the universal de destination of goods, which is a very technical term. But what it reminds us of is that all things are not owned by individuals, but they're owned ultimately by God. And God uh, distributes <laughs> and gives to the world what we need in order to, to, to survive and to thrive. And I, back to my original argument, the primary way that that is to be done is in households <laughs> and in groups. So there's, there's, a, there's a form of thinking about economics called distributism, <laughs> which emphasizes that it's not uh, goods, the good of all is not going to be achieved by nationalistic or universalistic ownership, socialistic collectivities, but it's also not going to be achieved by hyper-individualism, but it's going to be achieved by the emphasis of, on the household. By the way, that's what economics means. The term economics is based on the Greek oikos, which means household, and economics is the law or the science of cultivating and supporting the household. Economics, the law of the household. That's what that is. Uh, celibacy, yes, that is a noble calling, and it is one to which many have been uh, asked to, um, uh, to, to submit themselves to. But it, I would argue that it's a calling, and that it, it ought to be a discerned calling. Celibacy, by the way, the calling to celibacy is different from simply being unmarried. <laughs> uh, and I think we should... I actually don't like the word single. <laughs> I think single suggests that it's a natural state. Uh, I, I know a lot of single people are going to disagree with me on this. I think we have a guest. But, but our, our calling is, is to the marital household. There's more to say about that, but I think it's time to give away. To the <laughs> Thank you. Let's appreciate Dr. Reverend Doctor for this. And I think the paper will be available from the organizers, so if you need to read more of that, please come and ask, then you'll get the material. Thank you, and have a good time. God bless you. have the anthems please.
Thank you very much. Uh, that is my chaplain at Uganda Christian University. Um, once again, our dear chief guests, delegates, you are all welcome to Uganda Christian University. My name is Vincent Kiseni, and we are glad to host this conference on the family under the theme, the family in the 21st century. Strong crisis or changing? What is the future of this foundational unit of life in the community and in the nation? To start us off, I would like to invite the Vice Chancellor of Uganda Christian University to formally welcome you, our chief guest, together with all the delegates to this
Honorable Janet Museveni, the First Lady of Uganda, Minister of Education and Sports, the Archbishop of the Church of Uganda, here represented by the Right Reverend Nathan Ahimbisibwe, the Bishop of South Ankole Diocese, the Bishop of Mukono Diocese, the Right Reverend James Sebagala, the Bishops of the Church of Uganda, OHT Wa Walusimbi, we acknowledge your presence from Buganda Kingdom and uh, officials from the central government, my colleagues in the leadership of this university, my wife, Dr. Ruth Senyonyi. Yes, these things you've got to use the opportunity. <laughs> and all our distinguished guests, please allow me to welcome our guest of honor, Honorable Janet Museveni, the First Lady of Uganda and Minister of Education and Sports, Republic of Uganda. You're very welcome, Madam. <laughs> we are particularly proud to receive you as a UCU alumna. <laughs> if I may lightly say, I hope you have been renewing your membership of the UCU Alumni Association. We take pride in your good service. Furthermore, we could not have had a better suited guest of honor given your historic and consistent promotion of family values. You have been a champion for virtue and faithfulness in marriage and for the welfare of youth over the years. All these are pillars that the family needs. I thank you for honoring us with your presence. I acknowledge and welcome our sponsoring partners, Afri Child, uh, led here by the CEO, Mrs. Margaret Kakande. You are very welcome. We are delighted to see you here. We thank you for trusting us and working with us to bring positive impact on families. We need to continue working together as the task will not cease with this conference. I welcome all our delegates to Uganda Christian University we are proud to host this important family conference. As a Christian university, we are rightly concerned about family because family originated in God's mind. And Jesus came into a family, was nurtured and protected by family, actually drank water from Uganda, and he grew up in a family. At his cross, his loving mother watched in great sorrow. The conference on the family highlights our historic commitment to the welfare of society and nation. Mama Janet, I'm glad to inform you that Uganda Christian University was the first university to champion professionalizing child and youth care in our country. For years, we've had these following accredited degree programs. We do have a Bachelor of Child Development and Child Ministries, and also a Master's in Child Development. UCU offers this same discipline at our Constituent College, Mbale Constituent College, and at Uganda Matters Seminary, Namgongo, at Certificate and Diploma level. The intake to all these programs is in the Advent Semester, which is September every year. Please send your daughters and sons to these programs to secure the next generation and transform our nations. We are working to partner with the Ministry of Gender, Labor, and Social Development and with the Child and Family Protection Unit of the Uganda Police. Those are conversations that are ongoing. The family today is under attack. This is a generation of broken relationships, sadly, and families too are broken. First, we had HIV, which had its day, leaving us with child-headed homes. Yet still, some parents have become absentee landlords. They work hard to provide for children they never spend time with or know well. We are yet to fully understand the impact of increased affluence, social media, ICT, the global village phenomenon, and other modern life activities on family. Many are trying to redefine family to fit individual preference. Some couples don't even want children. For them, 
Family is the husband and wife. Children somehow become an encumbrance. Others define family around the property they have. I have talked to some who say, I'll marry when I have established myself to support my family. Read that as saying, I must have my property, my property, underline that. With the property, will the property be our property? Often property ownership and inheritance have superseded the value of family. In Uganda, children are mortgaging land where their parents live, rendering their parents homeless. Litigation increasingly characterizes our family relationships, even among siblings. Furthermore, we are creating a valueless family in this day and age. It's now culturally, culturally acceptable and fashionable to begin a family through cohabitation, while premarital and extramarital relations are the cause of the day. What is the price of a valueless family if family gives birth to the nation? For marriages and family need a reference anchor, and that we believe as Uganda Christian University. The husband and wife and the children should be able to define right and good based on transcendent truth. We cannot define these on our own. Only God, the author of family, can and should give the standards on which family is founded and lived. The hedonistic world wants a family that is established on pleasure. If it feels good, do it. Besides, if I choose to be a man today, though physiologically and otherwise I'm a woman, I should be allowed to be. That way I can marry anyone or anything to gorge my appetites. And we must contend with how all these distortions affect the children and therefore the next generation. We know that dysfunctional families have the propensity to result into a generation of social and psychological miscreants. Families are very important for passing on culture and religious commitments that in turn impart values, mores, and stability of character. One of the sure victims of modernity in the family today is communication. Family time together has diminished. Do families eat together, pray together, play with each other, talk to each other conversationally, and so on and so forth? Or is the best communication virtual on social media? You find young people sometimes just communicating, they may be siblings, in the same room, but they're communi communicating to each other via social media. Do we miss each other, or do spouses and parents live autonomous lives? Our society or nation will not be healthy when parents are alienated from children and vice versa, or when children are strangers to each other. We have an obligation to raise a generation in which virtue is prized and nurtured. A nation in which self-giving, family bonding, love, and nurture are virtues. This conference on the family is a step in that direction. I want to wish you all God's blessings as we build an, a stronger nation through our families. And so once again, may I say you are all very welcome, and we are glad to see you here. Blessings in Christ. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Senyonyi, for those wonderful remarks and welcoming our guests to this um, conference. Next, we are going to have remarks from the chairperson of the board of AfriChild. And AfriChild is partnering with Uganda Christian University to host this um, conference. Mrs. Margaret Kakande, you're welcome. Welcome with me, Mrs. Margaret Kakande. The First Lady, Minister of Education and Sports, Madam Janet Museveni, the clergy, members of the academia, civil society organizations, the media, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I warmly welcome you to this inaugural conference on the family. It's my honor to address you as we deliberate on improving 
the situation of our families in order to improve child well-being. Events such as this are defining moments to capitalize on our strength and to rethink our strategies on nurturing stronger families. Families remain, the family remains the single most important influence in a child's life. From their first moments of life, children depend on their parents and family to protect them and provide for their needs. Families have an important role to play in ensuring the safety and well-being of their children. Being a good parent will provide children with love and care, honesty and respect. We need to understand that our parenting skills will affect our children's lives positively or negatively in their day-to-day -day lives. Ladies and gentlemen, as we raise our children, we must think about what the top priority for them in life should be. According to a research on parenting practices undertaken by the Afri Child Center, the most important aspect of positive parenting was identified as a parent investing in a child's future, mostly through education. Conversely, failure to invest in a child's education through the provision of school fees, scholastic materials, feeding, to mention but a few, was the most cited attribute of poor parenting practices. Nevertheless, just sending them to school is not enough. It is important that as a parent, you harness a strong parent-teacher relationship in order to create a shared responsibility towards the child. Communicate regularly with the, the teachers in order to gain insights into your child's behavior and progress. From this, you can identify how to better support your child's development at home. Additionally, efforts invested in building emotional bonds with children during infancy are critical. Between a, chi a child is born to when it gets to the age of three, growth takes place rapidly and the child naturally wants to bond. So we must really show these kids love. If we have loveless children, we are going to have a loveless nation. The response that an adult accords them will affect them either negatively or positively for life. Therefore, it is critical that as parents, we aim to build a strong bond with our children. It can be as simple as everyday acts, such as reading stories to our children, playing with them, and even creating time to talk to our children. In addition, do not forget to give respect to your children. Remember, in order to get respect yourself as a parent, you have to give respect. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to seriously put children at the heart of the national development agenda, the critical role of parents and households has to be in, in terms of promoting children's health, development, education, and protection must be recognized and supported. On its part, the Afri Child Center has strategically positioned itself as a multidisciplinary research organization that conducts interdisciplinary research on children's issues, trains researchers and practitioners to conduct child-focused research and engages in policy and practice discourse. We do research in collaboration with the public and the private sector, the academia, and civil society. In line with its mandate of conducting research, AfriChild has conducted several studies on children, including research on parenting practices. The center envisions engaging in evidence-based advocacy with policymakers, the religious and cultural leaders, practitioners and communities in order to create a world where society invests well in children as a key element of sustainable development. Children are our future. We must invest where our mouth is. Finally, let me say that I'm humbled to see you 
You've actually turned up and graced the occasion in such big numbers. Thank you so much for coming. It shows your interest and intent to strengthen families. I encourage you all to continue growing with your children and installing positive values in them for a better Uganda. Thank you for good and my country. Once again, thank you for those wonderful remarks about family and the importance of the child in family. Now I invite the vice chancellor once again to introduce the chancellor to address the conference members. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our guest of honor once again, uh, Honorable Janet Museveni. Uh, we want to bring apology. The chancellor would have loved to be here. And indeed, in every way, uh, he's the one. Last year was a year of the family declared both in nation and in church. And when the year ended, the chancellor, our chancellor, who also is the Archbishop of the Church of Uganda, decided that this year too will be the year of the family. But he's abroad and he's unable to be here. However, uh, once again, God always has his very, very good people. And uh, the chancellor was pleased to delegate to the Right Reverend Nathan Ahimbisiwe, Bishop of South Ankole Diocese, to come and uh, speak, deliver his address to the conference on the family. So may I, and I know that uh, you did have a political leg in that particular diocese, so I think that's why I say he's the right person. So may I ask uh, uh, Bishop Ahimbisiwe kindly to come and deliver the address uh, in the name of the Chancellor. Thank you very much. The Archbishop's leg is every, everywhere in every diocese. So it's a privilege by the grace of God. The First Lady and Minister of Education and Sports, Honorable Mama Janet Museveni, Cabinet Ministers present, Members of Parliament, Heads of Diplomatic Missions, the Vice Chancellor of UCU and other Vice Chancellors, University Professors and Lecturers, clergy, I have my bishops here, students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Church of Uganda, please accept my appreciation for your coming to this conference. Indeed, I am aware that some of you have come here beyond our borders. Without your coming, this conference would not be there. Without your concerns and interests in family matters drawn from the various sectors of society which you come from, including religious organizations, civil society, NGOs, universities, and the private sector, this conference would not be taking place because you would not be here. This conference is for you and has meaning and purpose because of your being here. So thank you very much for coming and I hope that you'll be getting the most out of it and enjoy your time here. In 2016, I read the Church of Uganda in dedicating that year to the family when we declared the year of the family at our August 2016 Provincial Assembly. Accordingly, in my Christmas message to the nation of, in 2016, I formally launched the year of the family 2017. This dedication to the family was designed to help concentrate thoughts actions, resources, strategies, 
and plans of all and sundry in the church to family matters in order, as the case may be, to restore, support, protect, and strengthen families. At the time of the provincial assembly, we had singled out the following prominent forces that were eating away at the family in this present age. Domestic violence, child sacrifice, abortion, drunkenness, drug abuse, sodomy, and homosexuality, joblessness, poverty, permissiveness, and peer pressure. This I further clarified in my pastoral letter to all members of the Church of Uganda in my January 2017 pastoral letter. UCU at the Church of Uganda institution focused its energies in, in line with the year of the family in organizing for a conference on the family so that men and women would come together to reason on family matter, to engage with knowledge and understanding of various family issues, and to be exposed to new research on the family and the implications of the research to our understanding of family, action to support or protect families and planning for families. This conference then is very welcome and fully supported by the church and is in line with the church's goals on the family. Moreover, in holding it, UCU as a Church of Uganda University is doing what the church delegated it to do, which within a Christian framework and perspective is to teach, share knowledge and understanding, research on matters that trouble our world and region, and engage in scholarly ways with the same in order that solutions may be found. And this is what we are, as a church, are expecting in a variety of ways to take place through this conference on the family. So I wish to congratulate UCU for holding this conference. I also want to sincerely thank Afri Child for accepting to partner with UCU to hold this conference. I hope that this will not be the last of such a conferences. Lastly, but not least, it is my hope that all of you present here will be stimulated by the conference proceedings, will be inspired by them, and will make contributions through the 20 separate discussions, forums that will take place in this conference. I also hope and pray that you will also be mobilized into some action that strengthens or protects your family and the person on personal level. Furthermore, that you also be mobilized into some action at a public level, engage with those with the rivers of power to bring about the much needed change to the benefit of families in this nation. And when you are done, I hope that the community from this conference will be shared widely in Uganda to provoke discussions on family issues as well as bring about actions in the interest of families across the nation. Please make sure that top leaders of the Church of Uganda receive the community in both abridged and full version so that the fruits of this conference in words and intended actions do not remain exclusive to those who participated. Yours in Christ, the most reverend Stanley Tagari, Archbishop Stroke Chairman of Board of Trustees. Thank you very much for delivering the message of the Chancellor. And at this juncture, I would like to invite the conference convener, Mrs. Olga Mugedwa, to introduce the keynote speaker for the conference. Olga. The First Lady and Minister of Education and Sports, the Archbishop, members of the clergy, 
Oaștiwa, Mr. Olsimbi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have the privilege to introduce to you our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is Reverend Professor Dr. Samuel Abimerech Luvoga. He is a senior medical practitioner, having attained his medical degree in Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery in Macquarie University in 1974. He holds, he holds a, general, a master's in general surgery attained in 1979, as well as a doctorate of philosophy and anatomy that he attained in 1987. He has an expansive career as a medical practitioner, as an anatomist, as well as a lecturer. Rev Professor Reverend Dr. Luvoga retired from his service as an associate professor at Macquarie University in 2013 after 38 years of service. Professor Luvoga has served on many boards, including the Institute of Infectious Diseases as board chair and Mild May Uganda, where he's currently the board chair. He has also worked and tirelessly opened a hospital in Imperiwe, a Kampala suburb. He's the founder and executive director of Sustainable Leader Leadership Development that he started in, 20, in 2013. He was ordained as a priest in the Church of Uganda in the year of our Lord, 2007. This was truly a culmination of his missionary and evangelism work that he began when he was still a medical student. He is a family man, married to one Christine Luwoga, and they have, <laughs> and they have seven children and two of grandchildren. Professor Luwoga. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Your Excellency, the First Lady, Honorable Janet Museven, and Minister of Education and Sports, Vice Chancellor, the Chancellor, the clergy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is have been able to told to you by Olga, and I'm glad today that I came with my wife, Christine Luvoga. I keep telling people we are, we are only recently married, 45 years ago. <laughs> we got married when I was still a third year medical student. I had just lost my dad slightly over a year before that. I had inherited the care of 16 brothers and sisters and four and a half mothers. <laughs> we started off our marriage with no money but many responsibilities. The only capital we had was each other. In addition to caring for 16 brothers and sisters, we lost no time to start our own biological family. <laughs> <coughs> and we are privileged to have six sons and one daughter, and that daughter is fondly referred to as princess. We are still raising all the children left by our brothers and sisters when AIDS struck. In Ibusoga, omufutazara, meaning that if you are dead, you no longer have children. The children belong to those who are living. All these children of our late brothers and sisters are our children full stop. 
by the grace of God, by the grace of God, the number of children Christine and I are bringing up is continuing to grow. We have always been a very busy family since we got married, and it is by the grace of God that we are here to tell the story. The experience we have accumulated qualifies us to share with you these thoughts in this family conference. Thank you for the opportunity. <coughs> Definition, a family is a group of people consisting of two parents, father and mother, and their children living together as a unit. To belong to a family is to feel you have someone you can count on, one who shares your joys and problems. It, always mean, it also means to have respect and responsibility for each other. Family is an important word we use to refer to people we love. Family was God's idea. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, it is said, God created them male and female, not male and male. He blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. We are more than conquerors if we work together as a family. In Africa, we are our brother's keepers. In Africa, we value family. Did you know that in the world, of all children, 25% of them are born out of wedlock? Did you know that as many as 75% of all couples cohabit for some time before marriage? Did you know that the trend is for people to marry older and older? Now, the average age at which people marry is 25.8 years in women and 28.3 in men. Teenage pregnancies rates have dropped by 40% in the United States of America, but have increased greatly in Uganda, where 25% of all teenage girls have either had a child or are pregnant, as we speak. The landscape for children growing up is that 40% of young adults grew up in cohabiting families. 20% of children live with step-parents and step-siblings. These children um, have more, are more than 30% higher chance of developing aggressive behavior. This is a clear evidence that the family is changing, but not for the better. In fact, the family in this era is indeed in a crisis. A nuclear family is defined as a group consisting of only two married parents of opposite gender and their biological or adopted children living in the same house, sharing various duties and responsibilities. It is the commonest model of family in the Western world and is being adopted more and more widely in Uganda, especially by the more widely educated, by, by the more highly educated and wealthier sectors of society. The presumed benefits of such a nuclear family include that members develop self-sufficiency and independence. They feel they do not need other people besides members of their family. They share very strong bonds with their immediate relatives. They're, they're supposed to be less conflict 
of family values across different generations. However, there is less support for individual family members when crisis strikes. There is less contacts with the extended family, which may result in loss of tradition and poor development of communication skills. The extent to which these play out vary from family to family. A single-parented, single-parent-headed uh, family is one where one parent without a partner is taking care of children under 18 years of age. I was surprised to learn that some people become single parents by choice and even go to conferences of like-minded individuals. Contrary to what you would expect, some advantages of single parenting have been cited, and they include freedom to make all parenting decisions, such as what school to take your child to. In other words, all authority rests with you. Another presumed benefit, you and your children become good financial managers since you have to watch every penny. You and your children become a team since you have no choice but to involve them in all major decisions. Your children get your undivided attention, especially because the bitter arguments and disagreements you were having just before you broke up with your ex-husband or wife have come to an end. In Uganda, they say, Ogugwa teguba muka. Because the crim recriminations were like a bitter drink, but once you have swallowed that drink, it is no longer bitter. You are now self reliant. Tolina wa kukole rako ntondo. You have no one to blame for leaving it all to you. You own your own. Of course, there are some major disadvantages. You are always short of money unless you have generous child support from your ex-partner. You have to juggle several jobs, and this can be stressful and even harmful to your health. You can feel overwhelmed with all the work you have to do alone especially when your children are still too small to be delegated to. You can feel lonely and have no time to socialize. You, it can be difficult for you to set boundaries and discipline your children because they too are stressed and can react in rebellious and aggressive behavior. The children, surprisingly, may even be blaming you for wrecking what they may consider to have been a perfect relationship. Extended family has multiple generations, parents, children, uncles, and aunties, grandparents living together in the same household. There are many disadvantages that have been cited for this. One is high expenditure, greater difficulty controlling emotions and tempers, yours and theirs. There are too many toes to step on. The atmosphere may be difficult to control. Chaos may break loose any time. Members have less free time to themselves. There was a, 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 a song which was going something like this. There is too much to do. It makes almost, me almost dizzy. In a home like that, there is a lot to do. There is less privacy. Children often share room, rooms with each other and sometimes with adults. If room sharing crosses gender divide, the risk of defilement skyrockets. There can be a lot of arguments about everything, including what TV channels to watch. Rules are more difficult to enforce since children can be spoiled by their grand 
children, their grandparents, uncles, and aunties. I told my children, my job is to spoil your children, and your job is to do repair work. <laughs> However, there are also some significant uh, advantages of extended family. Children raised in extended families are quick to learn how to share, how to help out at home, and how to care. Without my, my grandmother, our children would not have learned Luganda, Lusoga, and English so well. She wouldn't speak to my children in English, although she could. The children develop strong social skills. They learn how re to relate with each other. They are always, there's always, they have always got company. They are never lonely. They have always got someone to play with, someone to fight with, and someone to share sorrows as well as, as joys with. Support from family is always in, is a rich, even in economic crisis. They save money and poor resources for development and big ticket items. Blended families. A blended family consists of a couple and the children they have got together and the children each of them got from previous relationships. These are very similar to extended families. I am a product of such a blended family. Since my father acquired many wives and from them acquired many groups of children. There is a phenomenon called grandparent-headed family. In today's complex society, with the dissolution of the nuclear family have, having become commonplace, grandparents are playing an increasingly significant role in the nurturing of their grandchildren. In Uganda, grandparent-headed families arose out of HIV AIDS epidemic that killed many young parents, leaving their elderly parents to assume the role of parents once again. This is a case of vulnerable grandparents caring for vulnerable grandchildren. In most cases, such families suffer extreme poverty and starvation is an ever-looming possibility. To make matters worse, such grandparents 